Hello, welcome back to the lectures on uh, compatifications. Last time we counted uh, all the scalars that uh, arise uh, when one compatifies a type two, uh, type two A more specifically on a Calabiao. This is the total number, but uh, by way of uh, of uh, uh, summary, let's uh, actually see what they are. Once again, let's collect them. So first of all, there were so let's introduce an index i. I realize that the index i is doing a lot of work here. Uh, the I also used it as a, a holomorphic index on a Calabiao. Now this is another i. Which goes runs from one to h one one or Calabiao. That's a number of parameters, and let me also introduce an index that goes from one to the number of uh, two one forms on the Calabiao. So the Scalars we saw were some geometrical scalars that I'm going to call VI and ZA. The VI are related to the deformations of uh, of J. But really, usually one introduces these scalars. Just as the coefficients of J itself on the on a basis omega i of uh, H11. And these are these parameters are all real. And similar to this, there was a last time also. An expansion of the B field on uh, on the same basis. And we also had uh, many scalars that came from the expansion of the of the uh, Ramon Ramon potentials. So in particular. C3 can be expanded on a basis of um, two forms. Uh, sorry, three forms. So uh, we want to expand it on the basis of H21 of the Calabiao. Remember how the diamond was. So this is a one, H to one, we did it twice, and then one. So such a basis So really the, when we expand the C3, we would encounter uh, two plus two H to one uh, scalars. And we need the basis. The basis is usually introduced um, in, as follows. If you look at the, so I need the preliminary remark. So really, we, we don't, uh, strictly speaking, we don't need this. We, I could just uh, introduce a, a new index that goes from uh, zero to two plus h to one, and introduce a basis for for h three, which is this uh, row of the Hodge diamond. But traditionally, one does something else. So the thing to notice is that the so we saw that the intersection.
So if I have two uh, bases of um, uh, two elements, let's say. Alpha and beta of uh, H3. Then recall from the lecture, from the very first lecture, I think, that this has a, a topological meaning. It's an intersection. It's related to the number Uh, of intersections of the corresponding A and B. We call this intersection pairing. But something I didn't notice at the time was that if I, uh, if I consider elements in H3, this is a anti-symmetric form. I call it pairing rather than just an inner power. That's exactly because of that. Because depending on whether you're the, uh, whether half the dimension is even or odd, this will be uh, symmetric or anti-symmetric. When it's symmetric, of course, it, uh, so for example, in D equal four, it, uh, de uh, it defines a, uh, a quadratic form. But when it is anti-symmetric, well, you have a, uh, it, it defines an anti-symmetric matrix in the space of, uh, in the space H3. And any anti-symmetric matrix can be put in the, in this form by change of basis. Unless it is degenerate, but it is not degenerate as a consequence of the uh, statements about um, uh, Poincare duality. By the way, here I meant uh, alpha is the Poincare dual of A, beta is the Poincare dual of B. So, long story short, uh, since the uh, this is this can be achieved, so the intersection. So in D equals six, this intersection pairing can be four, or can be put in the form. So what this means is that there is a, you can choose a basis alpha A, beta A, such that this pairing for two alphas is zero, corresponding to this zero block here. For two betas, it's zero, corresponding to the other zero block. And for an alpha with a beta, is the identity corresponding to this block here. So then, Let me reorganize the blackboard a little bit. I'll pull this down. How do I use this? Well, now uh, this index capital A goes from, let's say zero to H to one. And so with this, uh, and it's uh, well, clearly <laughs> related to this uh, 
index uh, lowercase a. It goes from one to h to one. And now the total of the alphas and betas goes from, uh, so it runs over this twice, but the, the, this number of indices is one plus h to one. So we have uh, uh, the total is two plus h, uh, two plus two h to one as it should have been. So then we can expand uh, on this basis, which I just showed uh, it has the correct dimension. And then to these coefficients, zeta and zeta tilde. Now, let me uh, collect these. So I could write these among the scalars um, just together, but I want to se uh, separate the two H to one of, of them, of these scalars. From the rest, from the others. We'll see in a second why. And then I'm almost done because the remaining scalars were the dilaton phi and the axion A. To be sure, there are other uh, fields that uh, um, deserve being called uh, an axion, other than this that we introduced last time. But uh, this is tradition called the axon in this context. Okay, so I collected the scalars. Like this, and let's now see why. All the vacua If we want to describe this Calabiao vector, have n equal to supersymmetry. So then the low energy effective action should also have at least n equal to supersymmetry. It's an interesting question whether you, you can in some uh, situation have a low energy effective action that uh, even has more than n equal to, but I don't want to touch it. Let's uh, just be content with, uh, with this amount. Now from your electron so super symmetry, I think you know, well, this is super gravity. Um, other than just a um, supersymmet n equal to supersymmetry theory without gravity, but um, not much changes really. It should contain A gravity multiplet. A vector multiplet. I mean, vector multiplets, plural, certain number of vector multiplets. And A certain number of hypermultiplets. 
in our analysis so far, we have limited ourselves to, um, to the scalars. Well, well, for completeness, let me remind you how this goes. So this contains uh, the metric and the gravitino, well, rather, sorry, two gravitinos. So we are in, in equal two, and then a vector field called the graviphoton. Each of these should contain each of uh, each vector multiple should contain a vector field uh, to gay genus and the scalar which is complex. to call it W. And finally, each hypermultiple should contain, well, a quaternion if you want, or two complex scalars. And then some other fermions that you might call a hyperino using the letter kappa here. We're not going to use it much anyway. For our analysis, what we really need uh, for the, the, the uh, reduced analysis that I, for the very limited analysis I'm going to do here, uh, we only need to uh, check how we can put these collect these um, so that they belong to the uh, scalars in such multiples. The only relevant ones which contain uh, scalars are the vector multiple and the hyper multiples. In particular, the vector multiple should have two real scalars and four um, real scalar, uh, the, sorry, the vector multiple two real scalars and the hyper multiple four real scalars. And the reason I, collected uh, the fields in this way is that here I see that these two sets organize naturally into H11, uh, two H11 scalars. So they, they, it's very natural to surmise that they correspond to H11 uh, vector multiples. This other line, you see that uh, corresponds to, well, these are complex. So these are the complex, uh, the complex uh, structure moduli. So there's a total for each value of the index A, there's a total of four scalars here. And so it's very natural to think that these come, that these give H to one hypermultiples. And finally, here I see four scalars, four lonely scalars, and it's uh, natural to think that it's a single hypermultiple. This is called a universal hypermultiple. Okay, so now you might say universe, uh, sorry, the, I mean natural, natural, but natural on my foot. I, there are many other ways that you could, this is just natural because you organized yourself the scalars uh, like this. For example, the last line, uh, really, so it's four scalars. So who says that uh, they cannot be just the, the scalars in two vector multiples? 
or for that matter also, uh, how about separating these into <laughs> um, two H2, the scalars of two H to one vector multiples. As far as we, our analysis um, shows, uh, that would be perfectly okay. So the, the next step would be to also try to match the vector multiples, sorry, the vector fields. Because I only looked at uh, objects that had uh, no indices on the space, along the space time, or two, which then can be dualized to, to none. And I didn't look at any fields that are produced with one index along the space time. And I should, uh, to make sure that this picture is correct, that this assignment to multiples is correct, I should look to, uh, at those as well. In particular, I should check uh, that there are H11, sorry, so here the total would be H11 vector multiples. And one plus H to one hypermultiples. But uh, so if this picture is correct, then I should, uh, when I reduce also, uh, when I look also at the objects that have a single index along the space time, vector fields in the space time, I should uh, get one plus H11 of those because there is uh, one vector in the gravity multiple and there's one gravity multiple. Exercise. Check that this is true. Also, oh, so this was for two A, and this result also then is valid for two B. Oh, sorry, for two A, for two B. I'm not going to repeat the analysis, but the answer is remarkably similar. It's exactly the same, but with the two numbers exchanged. Make this more readable. So to A and to B on a Calabria will behave in a similar way when H11 and H21 are exchanged. This might remind you also of a certain feature of the space of all Calabrias that we have seen um, yesterday. Now, uh, the next step would be to to study the action, so because there, it's not enough to just match the number of fields into the expected number of fields for an n equal to action. If uh, everything works the way it should, uh, the the, the reduction of the, so the, you should put, plug the, uh, the ansatz that the manifold is a Calabiao in the 10 dimensional action. 
and rewrite it. Uh, well, then use the approximation that the uh, manifold is small, and they should be uh, somehow possible to rewrite the whole thing in such a way that the uh, it reproduces it becomes a four-dimensional uh, action, which can be then cast in the n equal to uh, mold, so to speak. So uh, now I, I don't have a lot of time to, uh, well, we don't have time uh, for sure uh, to do that. It would require the same as the whole course, almost. Um, but first of all, yeah, we haven't <laughs> really seen the uh, type two action first. We will see something uh, later, but they, we also haven't seen, together at least we haven't seen, uh, talked about the n equal to supergravity. And then the computation uh, to check that the two agree uh, is uh, quite lengthy. Well, let me try to sketch at least uh, how the computation goes and what are the main actors. So first of all, the, uh, something I can tell you is that the, the kinetic terms So, okay, let me summarize what I just said, type two. On a reduce on a Calabiao, should give this n equal to effective action. First of all, a couple of things about this. Uh, uh, and n equal to action. Well, perhaps I can just write it. It's not that long. So here I call them a W. So in our particular two A case, the Ws were just a compensification uh, the, uh, obtained by putting together, for example, Wi would be uh, Bi plus R Bi. But already in 2B would be different. So here I'm just writing the general action for uh, gravity vector multiples. And hypermultiples. Um, this first kinetic term has the form that you recognize from, even from the vo volume of the string. Of course here, uh, this is a four dimensional action and it's not a full volume of the string at all, but the, the structure is really similar. It looks like it, it's uh, describing, uh, so that this G I J bar is a metric on the space of uh, depends on W in general. So it's a metric, it's a fact a metric on the uh, field space of the Ws. Same for this uh, second kinetic term. This depends on the use, the on the Qs, which are the hypermultiple scalars. So both of these have the structure of uh, really they look like a sigma model action. So they uh, look like they are describing maps from the space time to a certain field space. Uh, 
I'm going to come back on this, but let me finish the action just for completeness. Uh, actually, I won't need this, but I, it doesn't cost me much to write it. These are also, uh, these are terms that look like the connected term for some for the field strengths of the vectors. Let me put here eight actually. These Fs are the field strengths of the vectors in the vector multiples. And uh, including the vector in the uh, in the gravity multiple that we call the gravity photon. That corresponds to uh, I equals zero. All right, uh, F tilde is the dual of F as usual. Now, This D in general are covariant derivatives because the, uh, for example, the, it might be that some of the scalars are charged under some of the vectors. This would be certainly allowed for the, um, for the most general action, this would be uh, a killing vector in field space. And it, uh, informally, this is called the presence of uh, this term is called the gauging. You see, for a very simple case, such as uh, the generator of uh, rotation in field space, this would become linear in the Zs, for example, and this would uh, become the usual covariant derivative that you know and love from many. Uh, in many Lagrangians, such as in the standard model. And it would just tell you, okay, the ZIs are charged under, uh, under these A, the, all the vectors. And you would have a similar structure for the, the scalars in the hypermultiples. And now, where now this would be uh, killing the K here would be killing vectors on the field space of the hypermultiples. And again, this would be the gauging. Now, I haven't written the expression here, but the V. is determined by this case. For our case, for a Calabiao, the gauging are zero. and the potential is then zero. This is quite good actually, because we expected the potential to be zero because we want every, we want to have a large family of, um, 
of uh, vacua in this theory, uh, all with uh, zero energy. In principle, you could have even you could have imagined, okay, if I want a valley of vacuum, but perhaps I can include other scalars uh, that have a non-zero potential. But well, it's kind of, it's quite simple to see that those are, are um, it's difficult to 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 include also those while uh, keeping the n equal to um, requirement. Um, okay, this comment was not very clear, but let, let's say the, the fact that v zero shouldn't uh, make us sad in any way because now. It just means that every uh, every uh, point in field space uh, corresponds to a point uh, to a um, to a vacuum. The the remaining piece of data, however, uh, so it's really so. Well, we would need to also. <laughs> There are other data, there are these guys, perhaps I'll um, tell you something about them, but uh, this kinetic, let's say these kinetic terms uh, for, the, um, for the vector fields, uh, they're interesting, but they are also going to be determined by, so they're uh, in part determined by, by what I'm going to discuss now, which is the, ge the uh, geometry on the field space. So the GIJ bar is a metric on Amount, uh, field space of the vector multiples MVM. This should be a Kähler manifold. Which is sort of the impl sort of implicit in the uh, in my notation because you see that I wrote already G I J bar, so I was using comp at least I was using the fact that the space is complex that this uh, M V M is complex. Um, but in fact, more is true. Uh, supersymmetry demands it to be Kähler. This this should not be confused in any way with the fact that M six is a Calabiao. It's a different story. In fact, remember what I uh, was saying earlier is that this kinetic term is that of a single a sigma model. So it kind of describes the maps of M6 into this MVM. Um, uh, In general, supersymmetry, uh, imposing supersymmetry on the action of a sigma model tends to restrict, restrict the metric of the uh, target space, in this case, uh, MVM, uh, quite a bit. And uh, Kähler is a very typical condition that one finds. In fact, there are uh, more stringent, um, so there are more conditions on MVM by supersymmetry. And in fact, um, it should be um, sorry, I said Hodge Keller, but perhaps I can skip this. Let's forget about Hodge Keller. This uh, will be something that is uh, sensible to discuss for n equal one. Um, so manifolds, uh, so for an equal one action, let me skip directly to what we actually uh, need. So the, um, on top of what I was going to say, this is also a special killer. And what this is, well, this is just a notion that uh, more or less uh, physicists um, from modular spaces, uh, from field spaces of um, n equal to supersymmetry theories. There, is, uh, there are two versions of the definition, one relevant to uh, theories without gravity and one relevant to theories with gravity, which is the one I'm going to tell you now. 
So to describe this, actually before I describe it, uh, let me also say something about the hypermultiples. So G U B is a metric. On M uh, HM, which is the uh, just a word to describe the the space of the um, the field space of the hypermultiples, and this is called the quaternionic header. With a dash. With a hyphen, uh, because the <laughs> definition doesn't require it necessarily. To be clear. So, what is a quaternary Keller manifold? I'm not going to tell you. We are not going to need it. It is described uh, by not by a single uh, form, uh, two form J as a Keller manifold, by uh, by triplet of forms. Which obey a certain condition. Let's um, look at special Keller. Because it's uh, more interesting for us. So, given a Keller manifold, well, we saw that part of the definition is that there is a closed two form, in particular, it is symplectic. It turns out that locally, so we saw when we uh, discussed the, uh, the logic behind the, Kale, the Yao theorem that you could modify J by uh, del del bar or something. Infants, uh, J can be written as the del, del bar of some function K called the Keller potential. Uh, why is this? This is the Not uh, immediately tell you why, in, in the sense that it's a, a consequence of something called the del del bar lemma. So, as the, na as the name says, it's a lemma, it would need to be proven. Uh, I, I'm not going to prove it, it's uh, the same way as I didn't prove after all the, the Poincare lemma that tells you that the uh, closed form is uh, locally exact. And this is an improvement over that lemma that you can prove on, um, that you can show on. Uh, Keller manifolds. The uh, this i is just here because if you take the so j is real, if you take the compass conjugate of this, you're going to um, take my uh, obtain minus i del bar del. But del and del bar anti commute. So this is, in fact, I, the del, del bar. So this is why we keep this I, of course, and uh, this way K is uh, real. So 
locally defined. So now MVM is special scalar if the following things happen. Well, now uh, it's time to uh, tell you about the uh, Hodge scalar condition. So, first of all, uh, if I normalize J appropriately, then it belongs to H2 of Z. So it has, in other words, this has integral periods. To be sure, J is the scalar form on MVM. It has nothing to do, once again, with the uh, here now, with the um, J on M6. Of course, perhaps it would be wise to, uh, to, um, to use a different letter, I don't know, perhaps a calligraphic J, but I, um, I hope the context will, will, will make it clear what we need, what we mean uh, every time. So this is just a definition that you could give irrespective of supersymmetry. Uh, of course, it's motivated by supersymmetry. So um, this would be also relevant for n equal one, but. Uh, and this is the context in which it receives a name. The special killer means also something else, something more complicated. Uh, there, there is a vector bundle S which is holomorphic in the sense that it's a uh, um, transition functions are holomorphic. This makes sense because after all, I mean, so um, complex and even Kähler. Moreover, the structural group in which the transition functions Uh, valued is uh, this is p to n plus two, where n is the dimension of MVM, and there is a section. Um, call it a calligraphic V or new, I guess I will call it new. This is section uh, not quite of S, but of a, a bundle whose curvature is this. So if the, um, it is always possible to find the bundle such that L such that C1 is exactly this uh, one or two pi j. And now this is a section of this L tensor S, such that what happens, and this is the important property now, K, the Keller potential 
is minus the log of pairing on new bar with new. Um, so the, what is this pairing? It's simplicity defined by the fact that you have this SP structural group. Because after all, what is the SP group? It is by definition, the group of uh, matrices that uh, leave the uh, leave invariant, keep invariant a certain pairing, an anti-symmetric pairing. Pairing here is the one that defines the structural group. Okay, so the, uh, like I said, so the, uh, whereas the Kähler definition on the, or the complex definition were all very um, natural looking, this one looks like a mess. Like I said, it was invented by, by physicists, more or less, to, um, and there should be another condition, I forgot one. The pairing of new with its uh, uh, Dolbeau differential should be zero. So uh, the first time one sees this definition, one thinks, okay, this is a mess. So the, and a mathematician would never think of this. True. But at least we can now, for the Calabiao case, we can now see why it arises. So how, at least how it arises. So let's get back now. So the, after all this mess for the modular space, this is the part of the, the, so this is the field theory space for vector multiples in n equal to Lagrangian. So um, okay, this is a bunch of things that should happen. Impo they are imposed by supersymmetry. They don't look good, but uh, they should in particular happen when we uh, compactify on a Calabiao. So, Let's see who um, these things are for Calabiao compatification. It turns out that when you compactify on a Calabiao, um, who are these spaces? Now, uh, I will need to simplify a bit uh, the results. For 2A, let's see, what is the space? For 2A, we have the results here. I mean, we have the scalars here. The vector multiple scalars are these. The, we see that there is the modular space of scalar structures. And then the, the, these numbers parameters in the B fields. So if it was only for the modular space of Kähler structures, I could write here MK, modular space of Kähler. However, let me write it um, uh, a little differently. So I call it NKC. It's a complexified K 
qui a l'air moins de l'espace. Because it has also these uh, B fields. So the BI uh, are coordinates on a on a torus of dimension H11. And the first approximation, you can think of this torus so the, uh, of this guy as a bundle whose fiber is this T or the modular space of Kaler manifolds. For to be, um, BM is directly instead the modular space or complex structures. So this is complex dimension H11, and this is complex dimension H21. It's complex structure modular space. Now, for completeness, I should tell you also um, what the uh, modular spaces for hypermultiples are. However, uh, so let's see. We didn't uh, say much about what the special, uh, what the quaternionic there is. So I uh, cannot honestly tell you much. For today, we see, however, that there's a modular space of uh, complex manifolds sitting inside it. And then there are these, all these other guys, which are also um, periodic uh, by the way they are defined. Uh, they are also uh, parametrizing some torus. So I, I guess I can tell you at least the MQM is a bundle of uh, MC in the two A case. And that it's a bundle of uh, NK in the to be case. But what, uh, where does all that structure uh, that we saw come from? What are all those uh, sections? So, for example, what is that uh, uh, that new or calligraphic V? And why do we have all this uh, SP modular space? So, let's uh, to to see how this comes about. Let's look at this at the to be case first at the to be case. S was a bundle who's uh, um, with, a, with a rank, so the, whose fiber was uh, of dimension 2n plus 2. And what is that? Well, in 2b, the dimension of the modular space of uh, vector multiples is H to one. So N is H to one, and we need a space of uh, dimension two plus two H to one. And what is that? It's uh, well, a, uh, a natural space like that is H three.
And now you can say, well, wait a second, what the, the hell is this? What does it mean that H3 is the fiber of, of what bundle again? So the, this bundle, remember, so the, the, this bundle should have as a base MBM, which is in the to be case. MC. So a point in MC is just a choice of complex moduli. And well, so in particular, it means a choice of Calabiao. So then the, it makes sense that you associate to every choice of Calabiao the space of its uh, tree forms. So this is what the bundle is. And what could be this mysterious uh, section that we were talking about? It is just Omega, our old friend Omega. This is of course a tree form on M6, but this, uh, it is also a section of S. Well, I should also motivate why it is a section not quite of S, but it uh, also this line bundle uh, L, and that has to do with the way uh, it would take me uh, uh, some time to, to motivate this, but uh, um, it has to do with this uh, W that we were talking about at some point. When we were saying that sometimes Omega is not quite close, but uh, Almost. It has to do with the freedom to rescale Omega. Let's uh, let's put it like this. And the Kähler potential uh, is indeed one can show um, this. And now we also see what the pairing is. The pairing in this case is just the pairing in H3. <clears throat> the pairing uh, we saw earlier in the lecture that there is a pairing in H3. Uh, it's anti-symmetric. And uh, you may have not seen the connection of that pairing with the connection with the pairing that we uh, that I described when I was. Uh, that I introduced when I was defining a special kernel manifold, but in, uh, for this particular application, they are one and the same, they are the same pairing. Two A. Now the in two way the situation is a little subtle. Let me repeat the Hodge diamond for the end time. In the to be case, we talk, we took this line as a fiber. What are we going to take in the two case? Well, since the, the, the numbers are the same in uh, 2A and 2B up to exchange of H11 with H21, uh, then it's natural to take this column, which is H00 plus H11 plus H22 plus H Three, three. And the new is a little more complicated. It 
it's not quite J, which would belong here, but it's something that we could um, describe as e to the minus i j. What does this mean? This is a formal sum of forms of various degrees. One minus i j minus one over two j with j. So I'm just developing the exponential and every time I see a power, uh, what that power means is just uh, the, the wedge or the form with itself. So here j squared is just j with j okay. and the next power is i over six j cubed. And I promise there's a similar Now, uh, well, this can be further um, massaged, let's say. This becomes a more ordinary uh, this proportion to integral of j cubed over n6. So the structure in the two cases uh, is really similar. The two, so continuing along these lines, one sees that the effective action for reduction on uh, 2a and reduction on 2b are really similar. Every time you, well, we saw that you, Many things are exchanged, such as the number of scalars are uh, exchanged into A into B. If I take H11 to H21, H21, and H11. But this uh, is not just about numbers, it persists if you uh, consider even the structure, as we were seeing here, of the uh, effective action. So here, uh, everything is formally the same as if you replace omega with, uh, not quite with j, but with this formal exponential of j. So omega here would become e to minus ij here and vice versa. Now, uh, this, the J here parameterizes the vector multiple modular space and the omega here uh, parameterizes the complex structure modular space. The two have uh, superficially very uh, different structures, but the, uh, the Kähler structure modular space can be made more complicated if you put together um, the, those relative to various uh, Calabiaos, which have the same Hodge numbers. Okay, and now this uh, sounds a little mysterious, but they are, let's say that uh, if you are sophisticated enough, then the, even the modular spaces of complex structures and Kähler structures um, start looking quite similar. And all this in the end motivates a uh, conjecture. Oh, together, by the way, with another observation we had at some point, which is that the If you even, if you plot the space of known um, Calabiaos, you get uh, some mysterious uh, shape, okay? But which in particular is symmetric under exchange of H11 and H21. And all this motivated a conjecture called mirror symmetry. Which is that for every Calabiao, there exists 
a mirror calabial such that to a compatified on the original calabial is physically the same theory as to be on the mirror. All this, in all this, I only really use the, um, the effective theory uh, describing the, the, the four dimensional physics. There are many other points of view on the physics of a Calabiao. We could, for example, use the, the, um, the string, the worksheet point of view. Um, it would be really interesting, and uh, that would be at least, I would say, another lecture or another hour at least to, to, to deal with that. I have decided not to uh, treat the uh, the worksheet properties of Calabiao, so it is not now. If we will have any time left at the end, I will uh, uh, package, package together uh, the worksheet properties of um, several vacua um, in a single uh, mini discussion. But I mention it now to say that uh, at the worksheet level, uh, this um, this uh, mirror symmetry conjecture um, works really nicely and uh, it, it becomes uh, a very precise mathematical statement uh, that um, people have checked. Uh, so so the mirror symmetry by itself would be, uh, could be the subject of a whole class and even uh, it has been the subject of several books already. The um, one thing which is uh, worth uh, remarking is that the, it leads to um, some mathematical uh, statements that are, were not in, a priori obvious. So I'll uh, mention just one. Uh, in, um, within each homology class, uh, one can, there is a um, mathematical uh, problem, mathematical question, which is to count how many uh, sub, um, how many representatives there are which are um, holomorphic. What does it mean that uh, uh, subspace is uh, holomorphic? Well, it means that it can be uh, described by as the zero set of uh, a system of holomorphic equations. It was a mathema well-known mathematical problem to count how many representatives, um, holomorphic representatives there are in each uh, homology class. In particular, in H2, the question was, uh, well, how many uh, mathematicians would call those curves? Because the, uh, uh, an object of a single, of a dim complex dimension one um, is called the curve by mathematician because the dimension is one, if any, even if it is complex. So counting holomorphic curves was an uh, important problem, uh, important interesting problems for mathematicians, but uh, this symmetry conjecture, um, assuming it is true, uh, gives uh, the whole generating function for, that solves the problem completely for many Calabiaus, and those were checked by, uh, slowly by mathematicians and were all shown to be correct. So this is a powerful check on the overall uh, consistency. I mean, to, at least to my mind, uh, mirror symmetry gives uh, powerful checks on the overall consistency of, the, at least of the formalism of uh, string theory. So if the formalism was completely wrong, all these mathematical uh, uh, checks of the mirror symmetry uh, couldn't uh, possibly work. And uh, of course, the, the, whether it describes, um, string theory describes, um, our world is, uh, of course, a different matter. We now um, will consider generalizations, or rather, we will start looking at more general vacua 
uh, calabiaus are very important, but uh, we, uh, they also have some drawbacks. Uh, one that is often uh, mentioned is that the, the, uh, all those mass scalars are not realistic. They will rise, give rise to, uh, well, to many forces, uh, many new forces that we don't observe. So they would, uh, they are bosons, uh, the massless bosons, so they would mediate uh, some long range forces that we don't see. But um, also, uh, we don't live in Minkowski. There is a non zero cosmological constant. Well, um, motivated by this, let's now uh, consider, let's now start the exploration of um, more general vacua. However, for the time being, for uh, the remaining, the remainder of this lecture and the, um, and the next one, I'll uh, stick most, and uh, most of the next one, I'll uh, stick to uh, Minkowski. Let's say half of the, the next one and a half hour, at least I'll stick to Minkowski. And then we'll start introducing a cosmological constant. In fact, let me stress that by changing page. Minkowski vacuum, of course, the Calabia ones are also Minkowski vacuum, but uh, like I said, I want more Minkowski vacuum. Uh, let's start by reminding ourselves what the fields are. I look in type two uh, because these appear to be the most promising from various uh, points of view. However, the very first class I'll uh, look at uh, will also be um, relevant uh, for the heterotic, so-called heterotic theory. But let me focus on type two. So type two comes on uh, two flavors. Uh, well, we saw it uh, last time, really. But uh, okay, uh, we have this. Oh yikes! Sorry, it was almost out of juice. The bosonic fields. Are these and then to be the same, but the same for the um, for the Nair Schwartz fields, Nair Schwartz, Nair Schwartz. But then There are potentials with the even number of fields. This has a, also has a self duality um, property. Namely, if I consider it as a four form, well, uh, it's a modified four form where this also um, enters is self dual. Uh, let me not write it down here because, because now the next, the first class I want to consider is one where I also introduce BMN. So this will be important for both classes then, relevant for both classes. And I'm also going to allow for a non trivial phi. So earlier we, we just said, we set to zero everything and phi to a constant. 
uh, and then we allow G to vary. Now, the next step I want to consider is to have just the B field. And I'm going to ignore the Ramon Ramon ones. Later, I'll uh, switch on the Ramon Ramon fields and then I'll uh, give more comments. So, actually, let me not necessarily. Assume uh, Minkowski. I'll, I'll tell you that we'll um, shortly land on Minkowski, but uh, let me for now say um, that more generally, what is a vacuum solution? So, since now we are going to start an exploration of uh, Um, more general vector, uh, it's good to tell you what the uh, what the uh, more general vacuum is. What the vacuum is, vacuum solution is usually meant um, to be a maximally symmetric space in four dimensions times uh, cross an internal space. The maximally symmetric, what does maximally symmetric mean? It can be, so it, what it means is the maximum, that it has the maximum number of killing vectors that the uh, space can have in four dimensions, and that would be 10. But it, one can show that at least um, locally it is isometric to either IDS4 or Minkowski 4. Or the seat of four. The line element in ten dimensions for a product usually a mathematician would say, oh, it's uh, the the one of the maximally symmetric space plus the internal one. But um, really in physics, we can allow for a more general notion. Because here, so what we really um, uh, care about when we say that it's a vacuum solution is that, well, why, why vacuum? Because there is nothing, it's empty. Vacuum just means empty in Latin. So if it's empty, then uh, nothing, there should be nothing that breaks the um, maximal number of symmetries breaks the uh, killing vectors. So that's what we really care about, whether we care that the um, 10 dimensional space is this number of isometries. So then there should be nothing that uh, breaks those isometries. But if you put here a coefficient that depends on the internal coordinates, then you don't break those. So you're not selecting in any way uh, a particular preferring in, in any way uh, a point over another. So here, one can put a function a of the internal coordinates. So in general, I'll call ym these internal coordinates, and here I'll put x mu for the external coordinates. And so this A is a function of Y. It's called the warping function. Or just warping. So this uh, would, should be called the warped product. But uh, since it is, this is what we always take, I'll just say for that, and uh, it will be understood that I mean uh, warped for that. So 
So perhaps I can write this even better. This is a solution which has all the symmetries of a maximally symmetric for dimensional space time. Okay, so so far for the metric. Now for the so this sentence implies this for the metric. For the dilaton, what does it imply? Well, phi, in principle, no longer. I mean, no one says that it should be a constant in principle, but uh, for the same reason that we took a to be a function of the internal space only. We are also going to take phi as such a uh, function of the internal space only. And then what about the B field? The B field in uh, principle has uh, components, as we saw when we were compatifying BMN, BMU. We're compatifying on a Calabiao B menu. Now, uh, when we were compatifying on a Calabiao, we were wondering about the uh, the effective theory that describes everything, so the physics around the, the Calabiao uh, um, Calabiao vacuum, not just the physics, not the just the expectation value of the fields in the vacuum. If we are uh, concerned with the vacuum solution, then it's uh, easy to see that this wouldn't be good because this breaks the symmetries of MS4. In other words, the Lie derivatives with respect to the Killing vectors that uh, um, that uh, the time Killing vectors on uh, the maximum symmetric space they give it its name its name in fact um, of the of B minu of any two form B minu would be non-zero because there is no two form which is invariant under all the Killing vectors of a maximum symmetric space. It's easy to convince yourself of this in the uh, in Koski case, but also not so hard to see it in ADS, for example. So, uh, quite trivially, if you had, uh, say, a B with uh, which only has um, components B12 and not uh, B13, it would immediately break um, the symmetry and the rotations. And same here. Because this guy would be uh, seen in four dimensions as a uh, an object with a single vector uh, with a single index, and so it would be a, a one form or a vector field. And there's uh, once again no vector field which is invariant and all the all the symmetries of a maximum symmetric space. So both of these would break maximum symmetry, and hence we set them to zero on the vacuum. And what's B? is a purely internal form. Now remember that uh, associated to B in 10 dimensions, we have this guy. It's anti-symmetric derivative. In form notation, This reads like this. 
Now we just found that uh, B only has internal components, but in fact, it should also not depend on the uh, space-time components. Otherwise, once again, it would, uh, well, this time it, uh, in Minkowski, for example, it would break in variance under translations. So this uh, exterior differential only really has legs since it contains only the derivatives with the respect to the y, uh, it would also uh, have legs. It would also get a leg and on the um, internal direction as well. So this h is also at, uh, purely internal. In other words, it's a three form in M6. Okay, so these are the uh, conditions of a, for a vacuum. The later when we will uh, also allow uh, the Raman-Raman fields, we'll uh, have to update all this to um, include, um, to, to see whether, uh, uh, to, to impose, to see what conditions are imposed on the, um, on them by maximum symmetry. We'll see that it's almost the same. There's a, a one small change. But for now, let's stick to this. We saw at some point that uh, uh, supersymmetry for a vacuum solution Supersymmetry implies plus the Bianchi identity. Applies the equation so much. Well, we saw it uh, in the sense that I showed you how that works for the Calabria case, and then I said it's very complicated for the um, more generally. In fact, for the if you just include H and phi, it's not that. Uh, tragically harder uh, to see, but we are not going to see it. Right? Please believe me. And in this, in this case, the Bianchi identity that I'm referring to here is dh equals zero. Which is, of course, uh, automatically true if you know that there is h is db. Remember that this is only true locally, kind of like uh, in electromagnetism where the you have f equal to a a is only um, defined well it, it's a connection so it's only locally defined in the sense that it's not um, globally a one form in the same way b is not globally a two form uh, you can patch in a funny way h is in, instead a three form so talking about b can be mathematically trickier then talking about H. And so often we focus on H and then, however, we have to impose separately that the H is zero. So because of this, uh, if we, well, if you were to look for any vacuum, then we would uh, need to look at the equation of motion directly. But uh, suppose, uh, so if we uh, are interested, for example, in supersymmetric vacuum, uh, then we can be satisfied with uh, imposing supersymmetry alone. I don't even have to give you the uh, equation of motion. If I impose supersymmetry and it's uh, um, satisfied, so th that uh, there is preserved supersymmetry. That's what I mean. Then uh, the equation of motion will follow. So let's focus then on the. Uh, supersymmetry transformations. By the way, I'll uh, keep setting to zero the fermions, and it will still be true that I, uh, by doing that, I make sure that the transformations of the bosons under supersymmetry are zero. So I, I 
I can just focus on the transformations of the di Latino and Gravitino. The ones of the di Latino, of the Gravitino, uh, for the Calabiao case, so rather for the case where only the metric was non zero, non trivial, uh, were of this form. Now they change. This little a here goes from one to two because there are two gravitinos. It's after all a type two theory. And there is an extra piece. I write it down and, and then we see what it is. So these are the supersymmetry transformations with the fermions already set to zero. If I want to impose some supersymmetry, then I, I want that there exist epsilon one and epsilon two such that this is zero. What is HM? It's this guy. Notice that it, uh, uh, the H appears here in a very similar way to how omega uh, appears, the omega, the spin connection appears in uh, DM. But there's the sign difference here. The supersymmetry transformations of the di Latino were um, I didn't even give in the in the other case because they were identically zero given my assumptions, but now they are no longer zero, but rather they look like this. Once again, I should give a, oops, there's a, there's a typo in my draft. Sorry about that. I think this is a plus. And I need to tell you what this is, what these symbols are. In fact, there's very little to say. The, what I mean here is that there's a huge slash over the whole expression. I don't like putting these long slashes. So I have, over time, I have started putting a little slash here. What is the slash? Remember, it's the given alpha a form, alpha k a form. It's slash is obtained by replacing every dx with a uh, gamma. And you anti symmetrize the result.
But sometimes when the, oh, so okay, when there's a single letter, I just put a slash over the, over the letter following Feynman. But uh, sometimes it can be useful to just put it as a, at the end of the expression as an index, as if we were a label, so to speak. So in that spirit, this H, uh, slash here, so H is just one of six H M and P. So without the slash, you would have DX uh, M, DX M, DX P, and now here, right, M, gamma M and P. In the same way, this D phi. or in this new notation, the slash, I put it here, is just the length phi gamma m. Even this hm I earlier introduced can be thought of as um, a slash of something because it's the Yota M H slash. The contraction takes away an index after all. Leg to the form. Okay, so this is general given that we set to zero. Also, so the Fermions, yes, but also the Ramon Ramon fields, the C's. And now let's see what happens for a vacuum solution. Huh, now uh, this will be a bit of a computation. Uh, I have done it for you. Let me just uh, describe the result. So the D Latino here, each of the D Latino gives two possibilities because you have either M, capital M to be little m, meaning it's an internal index or an external one. The former case just gives the same equation, but with an internal spin. Let me remind you. Uh, the sorry, the spin of the composition. So this here, I'm trying to keep the same that I had for Calabria. Ah, but sorry, there's something to say. I, I don't necessarily want to keep now. Uh, eta one equals eta two. Otherwise, the, this is the same expression we had for for Calabria. So. Um, in the Calabiao case, I motivated it 
um, by saying that it's uh, harder to look for a solution with uh, more than uh, one eta. Actually, I'm soon going to do the same here as well, but I want to, I first want to, to see what happens before I, before I do it. It's the ex internal gravitino. Then let me look at the external gravitino. For the external gravitino, I now in general need uh, something that tells me what happens when I act with the d mu on zeta. On the zeta uh, i. Sorry, this is two. This is one of the pieces where the, uh, um, just mathematical, uh, the places where mathematical consistency alone doesn't um, really tell you what to do. Here, um, that you face a choice of what your supercharges should be. So the zeta um, then parameterize the supercharges. So remember that uh, when you count them, these are the eight supercharges that we had for, um, for Calabiao. And uh, for a Minkowski space, it would be quite clear um, that we that the, taking them to be constant uh, seems to be a good idea. Uh, however, not so for the, um, for the cases with the non-zero cosmological constant. Uh, in fact, very soon I will uh, get back to that case for now, but uh, um, I want you to get used to the idea that eventually we have to decide what to do for more general spaces. And also for uh, Minkowski, why should it be the case that we take them to be constant? Can there be some more general choice? Actually, this has been debated uh, uh, quite a bit. Uh, so there are various um, uh, answers uh, that can be considered. And one is tempted to try and um, um, to use the just mathematical consistency to, to, to set the, to fix the choice once and and for all, kind of like what we did when we used the uh, symmetries of the, the definition of, um, of vacuum so that the solution should have a, a maximum symmetry uh, to restrict all the fields. One would hope that the same would happen for the, um, for the superchargers. However, to my knowledge, this has not been really uh, fully analyzed. Um, what, what one does, is this, there is a natural set of spinors on a maximally symmetric space that appear in many problems, which are called killing spinors, which uh, satisfy this condition. Conventionally, one puts a one over two here. Um, actually, let me, one can put a parameter. Mm. Damn it. Parameter I call mu. These are called killing spinos. Why do we do this? Well, along with the killing vectors, so the killing vectors of a space time 
of, a, of any uh, manifold from um, Lie algebra. Now, if we, the killing vectors and the killing spinors together form uh, Lie super algebra. So that's the uh, reason that uh, you, uh, considering killing spinors appears to be quite natural together the, with the killing vectors. However, in principle, it would be possible to imagine other uh, possibilities. But the, uh, if what you want to observe, if you demand not just that, they, uh, that they, it's a vacuum solution, but also, and, and that it's symmetric in the sense that there are some superchargers, but also that the super algebra that of your solution is the same as what you would expect in four dimensions, I think. Uh, it's, uh, it should be inevitable that you, uh, the uh, choice falls on, uh, on the killing spinoffs. However, uh, the door remains open and some, some researchers have even called into question this uh, choice saying that uh, perhaps there are more general possibilities. I, I think this is not the case, but it has not been proven. So I'll keep doing what everyone else has done and I'll assume this. So the, um, and now the, I don't want to show you the uh, full computation, but what happens here. So the why the, uh, so in, even for the um, internal Gaviton, uh, Gavitino, there was a comment here, of course, I got rid of the Zeta. There would have been a Zeta multiplying uh, this here, but uh, then such an equation uh, implies the one I wrote. Because for the tensor product of two spinors to be zero, you need both to be zero separately. And uh, something similar uh, one does for the external Gavitino. Oh, sorry, this is external Gavitino. After uh, you act with the covariant derivative on the on this zeta, you replace it. Uh, so that uh, this equation, this Killy spinor equation, uh, lets you replace it with a mu and with the gamma mu. Now, the other terms in the equation happen to have a gamma mu zeta as well. And so you can factor it out. And that's the when all is said and done, this is what you uh, get. Now here that would be equal zero, but there is an extra term. With the derivative of the warping function. Why does that appear? Uh, it appears because the, if you apply, the, if you compute the spin connection for a warped product, it is not, uh, it does not consist only of the uh, spin connection of the space time and the spin connection of the internal components, but rather there are some cross components and I did all that computation for you. Um, and I got this, however, exercise. To, uh, one perhaps lengthy exercise is to reproduce the expressions I'm giving now. And now here, this becomes two. And there's a sign difference. And finally, the di Latino. And these are less surprising. They will basically remain the same only now this uh, d and h are purely internal
Okay, so now we have a set of supersymmetric regions which are, which are quite a bit more intricate than the ones for Calabria. For Calabria, we, all we got was that we had um, uh, to look for covalently constant uh, spinors. And now, instead, we get these complicated conditions. When the, if, you, if we had uh, right away um, also introduced the, the Ramon Ramon fields as well, they would be even quite a bit more um, complicated. So next time we'll uh, analyze these ones for the, um, for the, for this case with the uh, Navier-Schwarz uh, fields, and we'll see what they what they give. The mathematical conditions are still uh, relatively nice. For the uh, for a more general case with the Ramon-Ramon fields, uh, they uh, they don't look nice at all if you uh, write them directly. We will see a couple of um, classes next time. Uh, otherwise, however, we'll um, we'll have to develop a new formalism, uh, a more sophisticated formalism to avoid um, getting our equations to be uh, um, ballooning in complication. So, and that will, um, that formalism will uh, take the more or less the rest of the lectures. Okay, that's enough for today. Thank you.